so I, I always joke that I have this kind of we can all win strategy to the way that I approach things mm -hmm. because there are opportunities for everybody uh, to win. And I'm always looking for those ways. I uh, People have heard me say this many times, but I often say that I'm a trained intellectual assassin. <laughs> because... <laughs> You're so funny. I love it. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to our fantastic podcast. This is the EDU AI Unlocked podcast with me, Ashish Panando, your host and your global survival guide. That's what I'm known as uh, for students. Uh, but today we're here joined by Jill Blondin uh, from Virginia Commonwealth University. Hi, Jill. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Yes, I, I actually honestly wish I had recorded the past 10 minutes because we had such an amazing conversation about Jill's visit to India. Jill, we will probably talk a little bit about that. I'm more than happy to talk about that. Fantastic. So um, I hope I get this right. I, uh, I've i researched your profile and I'm just, uh, uh, I'm amazed at all the things you've done in your journey where you started with art history you actually have a phd in art history a bachelor's in art history as well we're going to talk about that would love to hear <laughs> that that background and how it ties into your role right now but right now jill you're uh, you're working as the associate vice provost for global initiatives at the university correct I am, yes. I lead all global initiatives at VCU um, across uh, our campuses. We have a campus, uh, we, we actually have two campuses in Richmond, a medical campus and what's called Monroe Park, which is our academic campus. And then we also have a campus in Doha, Qatar, uh, in Education City that is focused on the arts. Fantastic. So it's mostly... Is it all focused on international students when you say global initiatives? It's also domestic. Tell us a little bit more. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a that's an awesome question. So I lead uh, global initiatives and I direct the global education office, and our office is divided uh, into. And it, I'll tell you how it's divided because I think that gives you an idea of my purview. Uh, and we have so we have immigration services, uh, which of course serves our uh, international students and scholars. We also have. Uh, global partnerships and outreach, which involves our articulation agreements and our international partners, but also um, outreach, which includes international student uh, recruitment. Um, we have a, uh, an English language program, which focuses on uh, readying uh, students and even community members uh, in English language so that they can matriculate into the institution or, you know, develop professionally. Not all of our students go on to the institution, although the majority of them do. Um, and then we also have global learning, which is, I think, probably the most innovative aspect of our unit. It's uh, something that I created where I looked at uh, it, sort of the global learning trajectory of both international and domestic students, or in other words, VCU students. <laughs> and I asked myself, how do we serve them best? Um, how mm. do we help them? How do we meet their needs? Whether the desire is to engage with other students or activities on campus or uh, to study abroad. Um, and also how to, uh, you know, what global learning opportunities do we provide on campus to all our students? And so I created this unit that's really kind of holistically looks at global learning. So it has aspects of international student engagement, but it also and on campus global learning, but it also has an education abroad, uh, you know, function to it. So it's it's really interesting because it, it answers to me the question, uh, it sort of looks at students, like I said, holistically, and then tries to solve problems for them. I, I always say that students come to our office looking for, well, you know, they're looking for answers. They're also looking for transformation. Mm -hmm. And so that unit, I think, uh, very much helps in that space. And the reason I say that is because a student might not even know they want to study abroad, or they might not even know they want to be part of the Peace Corps prep program, or that they want to volunteer to help an inter international student uh, acclimate to campus, or an international student 
uh, can participate in all sorts of activities. Like on, we have an advisory board of international students who help advise us on the best way to serve them. So there are all oh, sorts wow. of ways that they can engage in that space through uh, global learning. So it's 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 defined sort of very broadly at our institution, but it's um, it's been working really well uh, because I believe very mm. strongly that international offices, you know, people oftentimes talk about how siloed institutions are, but I also think that international offices are siloed. So I've mm -hmm. tried to break down some of those barriers in my own office to help improve the experience of all VCU students. I love it. I love the <laughs> summary. And, and uh, I think rightly so. You're also therefore the chair of uh, outreach at AIEA, right? I serve on the board of AIA, and I'm also the chair of the Member Outreach and Awards Committee, uh, which is yeah. really exciting because we really get to we get to think about a couple of things. One is, yeah. uh, you know, how to grow membership, but how to retain members too, which means we're always thinking about ways that we can improve uh, the experience of people who join AIA. How can we help and maximize the benefits and you know opportunities that yeah. AIA provides, which I think it's a fantastic organization. So I'm a, I'm a real cheerleader for it. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it looks like we're getting a theme going here. I mean, you're, <laughs> you seem to be a master connector. You, you, I feel enjoy connecting the dots, especially with internationalization and bringing the world closer to each other. Would that be a right way of summarizing you as a person and your work? Oh yes, absolutely. That's yeah. and I mean I think you've actually said it more eloquently than I ever have. Um, but uh, <laughs> but I do think that I, I absolutely I always think about ways. So I I always joke that I have this kind of we can all win strategy to the way that I approach things mm. because there are opportunities for everybody uh, to win, and I'm always looking for those ways, whether it's. Uh, challenging some of my own staff members uh, to think about what their next role or their next step is to trying to increase opportunities for students or working with my other senior international officer colleagues to think about ways that we can connect because I feel very, very strongly in interinstitutional collaboration. I think that, I mean, I always use the example of COVID when there were a changing immigration, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, issues that were, that yeah. we were all facing as institutions nationwide, and that everyone went back to their, you know, legal counsel, their immigration offices, their PDSOs, and this is in the U.S., and we all sort of asked, how are we going to address this so that we can, international students can stay in status with this changing guidance? Guidance. This, oh, I should say, potentially changing guidance that happened mm. during COVID, and 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 that we came up with this five thousand people came up with the same solution, <laughs> basically, and you know, in order yes. to keep students, and, and I and and it was a a real eye opener for me. In I'm not going to say the waste of resources, but it got me thinking about the way that we could redeploy resources to benefit everybody. Um, and so how do we work across institutions? How do we work broadly in order to help everyone and elevate the conversation and the solutions? And so that that's just the way that I feel about international education writ large. And so I, I think it's really important for us uh, to be working together and connecting and mm -hmm. it helps us all. So it's not to me, I think that our field is extremely generous and friendly. And so we can also take advantage of that opportunity, you know, the generosity, not, I'm not saying take advantage of everyone's generosity, but to really leverage those opportunities so that we can all work together for everyone's benefit. Because I really, really feel that this is a field that, that really allows that. Love it. And I think we got the, you know, we usually pick one like hard hitting statement out of the whole <laughs> podcast to make it like our center right. of, uh, yeah. And we got, we can all win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can all win. Like, and that's yeah. what I think. And I think that part of it is a mindset. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's not because you don't want to come from like a scarce resource mindset, but you want to come from the just again, it, when I was talking about the global learning unit, we're problem solvers. And, and you were talking earlier about me being an art historian um, and having studied art history. And that goes directly back to 
my liberal arts background, the fact that I had to be a real critical thinker. I uh, People have heard me say this many times, but I often say that I'm a trained intellectual assassin. <laughs> because <laughs> because a as a graduate intellectual <laughs> assassin wow <laughs> which, sounds, which sounds actually after all of the kind of sunshine and light that i've said about generosity suddenly <laughs> uh, suddenly the podcast takes a very different turn right but um yeah. <laughs> so you're like what and Funny. so but what yeah. i what, but what i really really mean by that is that because of my background where i had to you know make airtight arguments as to in my case you know, why a 15th century pope refashioned Rome, uh, which sounds not related uh, to what I do now, but but really is. I, I feel as though I had to, you know, mm. find uh, my, you know, uh, find information, find evidence to back up my arguments. And if it weren't mm. there, I could not make the argument. So if you apply that to the job I currently have, I, I'm always looking for solutions, but I need that data or I need that evidence. And so I always come it's sort of ready at, at meetings uh, to to ask some really hard questions about why we're doing what we're doing. And that comes completely from my background in art history, which I, I often say too is, you know, it's it's math, it's science, it's economics, it's history, it's sociology, it's it's everything. It brings everything together and it really leads you to question the why. Um, and I think that in, in many ways, I'm really well suited for the job that I have because the institution needs me to be asking those questions in order to serve students optimally, faculty and staff as well. Fantastic. Fantastic. And uh, I'm sure those meetings must be pretty interesting with some of those intellectually assassinating questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. I always <laughs> the reference well, I always... to a 15th century pope in a meeting. <laughs> oh yeah, we. Well, it's funny because I, 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 my uh, uh, PD, the PDSO, the head of immigration at BCU, uh, he has his doctorate in religious studies. So we oftentimes the way that we talk about sometimes we'll make connections to some of the very the very contemporary issues we're facing by um, discussing things like the Council of Trent or like, well, we'll talk about the sack of Rome. Like, I mean, it's 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 kind of interesting, but we both know, like, it, it, it's, it's interesting to be able to make those connections in some ways. And it, it sounds funny, but but it really does uh, bring to bear, uh, like, we're, we're literally speaking the same language. And so mm. it, it's, it's an interesting approach. But I think and, and I'm not saying I mean, I, I oftentimes I'm sure that I at least once a week probably refer to Leonardo da Vinci, or talk about the Sistine Chapel. But uh, it, it, it oftentimes it's in service uh, of something greater that we're uh, discussing. And I think that it's a, a t I also think that there are opportunities and 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 we uh, my team and I have discussed this but the the idea too of authenticity in the work that you do and bringing your knowledge and bringing who you are to your role mm -hmm. I, I think is important as well so I think that yeah. that's laid over that I mean it would be uh I, and so I think it's it's really important uh to to sort of find yourself or or to allow yourself to be in that space uh with yeah. your team and it's also hard it's hard for humans to to bring their own self like you you so proudly carry your background in art history mm -hmm. and you talk about it and you bring it to meetings you already made like five references just in like the, <laughs> the last the past 15 minutes with me and it just it shows your confidence in in yourself and 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 your your background it's amazing i love it uh, well, I, I appreciate you saying that it's, it's, I'll, I'll connect. We were talking earlier before we start recording the podcast about my recent trip to India. And it's interesting because when I was there, I met with a partner university. We had just signed uh, an MOU uh, with a partner university and the provost there is an artist and a poet. It's a, it's a design focused institution. And we started talking about art. I mean, we had the opportunity to talk about 
uh, students and articulation agreements and innovation and opportunities to look at collaboration across both our institutions. Uh, but one of the ways that we sort of got there was through a discussion of art history and poetry. And I thought mm. to myself, well, gosh, I'm at the right institution, uh, but I'm also talking to the mm -hmm. right person. And it made me realize that so often we also are not always bringing the joy that brought us to academia. And that was a great example of us sort of seamlessly weaving everything that's important to us into an opportunity for collaboration. Wow. Wow, this is great. And this is actually <laughs> the essence of our podcast, right? Is uh, is I always I'm always trying to find connections of how yes. how people got here. And uh, I still have that question. I mean, you're so embedded in art and history, and I can sense it <laughs> so very well. How did how did that whole journey happen to get you into an institution to do what you're doing today here? <laughs> Oh, that's a, that's such a great question. So, uh, so yeah, I I always start by saying that I originally I had no ambition for administration. I was an art history professor on the tenure track and then tenured um, in at an institution in Texas, and I had. And I would say I had a wonderful nine month life where I taught for nine months. Um, I I had. Uh, three small children at the time. I still have three, well, big children now, <laughs> uh, but I, and, and I had my summers so that I could research in Italy um, and also lead study abroad. Um, and so I, I had no real ambition for administration, but it kind of came to me um, mm -hmm. in the form of a special project that my institution was doing around internationalization. And they were looking for someone who had international experience uh, in like pedagogy and curriculum, but also a PhD, which I unfortunately had both. And so, and of course I'm kidding when I say that, but, sure. and the reason I'd had experience is when I first got to the institution, which was the, which is the University of Texas at Tyler, I um, decided that I wanted to lead study abroad because it had been so transformative for me. And I designed a program in Italy for my students and I organized everything. I, and, and I, I, I joke now that I did not follow best practices. We didn't have an international office there. I was sort of doing everything myself. Um, when I, when, when the 2024 Jill Blondin looks back at the 2004, 2005 Jill Blondin, like I really, uh, you know, shake my head <laughs> because it was not, although the students, I, I want to be clear that the students were safe and we were on a good program, but the way sure. that I went about doing it, uh, it could have used some administrative oversight only because I, I was both working too hard. And also there were things that I, I would have, I think I would have done differently just to make it easier on me and the institution. Um, but having led study abroad several times uh, provided me with that kind of administrative and organizational um, acumen, uh, which I think sometimes you don't always associate with faculty members. And I say that as a faculty member, uh, but the institution recognized that and asked me if I would consider leading this project, uh, which which I reluctantly did uh, and not because, but, but it was a really great experience immediately because I realized mm. several things. The first was that there had been a part of me that it's sort of a skill set that I had that was not being used as a faculty member. And that was the organizational, operational, logistical, and and, and also the visioning part of, of what things could be. I mean, of course, I did that with my classes and my study abroad program, but uh, that was that was huge. And then the second part of it was that I immediately realized that I, by taking this administrative role and then being responsible for campus-wide internationalization, that I suddenly had impact over a much larger number of students than I had previously. Uh, whereas I had been, you know, teaching art majors and also, you know, students who are fulfilling general education requirements. And that was great. And I have, mm -hmm. I'm still in touch with so many of those students who I, you know, feel so privileged to have met and taught. But the idea that suddenly I went from, you know, several hundred students a year, let's say, to 
a campus of at the time, I think it was probably around, you know, six or 7,000, realizing that I had expanded my impact into an administrative role changed my mindset because I saw what honestly, what one person or one office could do for an entire campus. Uh, yeah. And so that was, that was a total shift for me that told me that moving into administration was the right thing because I really, really now um, see my role as expanding my impact uh, for the good of students and faculty and staff. So that, that was really the way that I got into it. And then once, um, then there was an opportunity at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University to lead a brand new global education living learning program, which is essentially something that I had been an aspect of what I'd been doing at UT Tyler. And so I then uh, came to uh, VCU uh, to lead that program, which I also saw as being able to expand my impact on a bigger stage at an institute at a research one institution. And then um, I, I uh, eventually got into this role uh, as leading international initiatives um, under various titles. But uh, and and so here I am now, and it's pretty extraordinary to think about mm -hmm. the opportunities that you have to uh, impact, you know, nearly twenty nine thousand students at VCU. So that's that's yeah. super exciting for me. <laughs> Fabulous. I mean, I, I I see why this role excites you and why. Uh... <laughs> You're still able to connect to your roots on on art history, fantastic. Yeah, uh, yes, and and I think that it's it comes from yeah. to me. It's you know there are conversations around you know how how with, with senior international officers you know how how do people ascend to that role? Some people uh, come from an administrative background, and some come from faculty, and I think both uh, can be very successful. Um, it's just it, it's. It, it's it's the way that I did and, and it's what's made mm -hmm. sense to me. But the way that I sort of make sense of my trajectory is through that, is through impact as much as it is through um through my own uh you know uh, background in um in art history. Fantastic. Um and now that you're you're back from India and you have mm -hmm. a lot many more thoughts uh about India and its history and the institutions you met and people you met. Um, now that India has kind of taken the first spot in terms of uh, international students and, you know, people traveling abroad, especially with what's happened with China in the past couple of years. Um, but now it's become sort of a rat race on both sides, right? There's on, on this side, institutions trying to grab as much land as they can, as many students. On the other side, now there's like this entire burst of agencies and platforms and all of that uh what's what's your what's your thought on where all that is going and how do you feel that's, about it that's such a that's such a great question because it's something i think about daily um and but i i'm not i'm not sure that i would say that my opinion changes uh mm -hmm. daily like i i think about it um and i think it's I, i'm glad you asked that question because i think it's one of the most important questions that we need to be asking in international education uh, both uh, just globally of how we engage with our partners in other countries, and especially in a place like India, which every time people talk about India, uh, I would say that you would be like, and three, two, one, someone's going to say national education policy. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're going to talk about the NEP. And <laughs> so so I, I feel as though there are like specific talking points around the way we we talk about India that yes. sometimes lets us as international educators off the hook as to what our intentions are and that we have to be really thoughtful about the ex like I, I just spent 15 days in Italy, in, in, excuse me, India. See, I'm still talking about Italy, but I just okay. spent... 15 days in India and my, and, and of course that's by no means some type of comprehensive, you know, uh, you know, understanding Summary, anything, you know, yeah. and, but, but I, but I work there regularly. I work with partners there regularly and my uh, impressions are, are a couple things. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind in working with India and with any partner is, is, and that should always be top of mind uh, is reciprocity, to think about mm -hmm. the way that we're working to benefit 
in, in, and I'm going to talk about uh, campuses, for instance. How are we benefiting both campuses? What are we doing to help students and faculty do do what they need to do? Again, kind of that we can all win approach. Like, how, how do we do that? Because that that has to come down to your philosophy in partnerships. It cannot be like like and 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 we see this too. What, what the concept of a rat race or the you know all the agents and everything that's going on. Of course, we're recruiting in India um, because there are, there is a demand. Um, and as you also rightly pointed out, the geopolitical situation um, has changed and India is now the number one center of students uh, internationally. Um, and, and we've seen that borne out in things like Open Doors and, and, and others. Uh, and, and as it approaches, you know, it's approached China. But I, I think that yeah. What we need to be really clear about is fostering sustainable relationships with our partners to benefit students and faculty at institutions in India and and in the United States. And with that, and you know something, that's harder work than yeah, oh yeah, and, and but it's also the right thing to do uh, because there are things that I think that as we talk about that. That you see in the NEP that you don't always see in conversations uh, that are led, let's say, U.S.-based conversations around Indian international education, which are things like, why aren't we having more students from the U.S. studying abroad in India? We really mm. need to be fostering those opportunities for students to learn reciprocally. That can come in the form of a short-term program, like a short-term exchange. Yeah. I mean, there can be baby steps where we we start with institutions, but it, we really do not need to be having one-sided conversations about our relationships. We also want to think about, I think, again, going back to my dear, or my conversation around generosity, but I mean, also thinking about uh, curricular, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to say sharing, but I'm not sure that's the appropriate word, but curricular exchange sure, it is. Yeah. benefit, um, both, uh, you know, institutions. I think we can think about, I mean, one thing that we've noticed, the, the thing that I noticed and I've noticed in the past several times when I've traveled to India is the similarities of the work that we're trying to do on behalf of students. What, mm -hmm. you know, in, especially in innovation and entrepreneurship, I was at uh, Gujarat uh, Technological University, for instance, and I uh, was privileged to see several students present uh, really interesting projects that were, you know, solutions to problems that they had identified and I, I and and a lot a lot of them were in the kind of I, I'm going to say agricultural like uh, agricultural space mm, like mm -hmm. questions about uh you know how to treat soil like and, and to optimize yeah. crop growth um you know questions around uh, but but using using ai for instance uh considering uh the number of languages that are spoken let's say in gujarat um how could a farmer uh speak into an app uh, a question that they would have in any language and have uh you know an answer to you know, an agricultural question. Yeah. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. that, that was a really interesting example uh, that one of the students presented. Um, also, the idea of, you know, uh, maximizing protein in milk, for instance, and 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 mm -hmm. being able to intuit that to uh, the consumer or, so, or, or to be able to provide that information. Like, there were some things that I never even thought about. And I yeah. thought, yeah, okay, this, the, the, okay, first of all, there are, a ton of bright students at this institution and they're solving problems like the students at VCU through our Da Vinci Center coming up with products and things. So how do we exchange that? Like to, to me, I think a lot of when we think about the future of education, I think it's, I mean, it's what everyone says it is, right? It's interdisciplinary, it's transformative, it's uh, it's going to be experiential and that, and, and when I was there, I was like, I'm looking at, I'm looking at not, I'm not looking at the future. I'm looking at what is right now. And this is what, and this is what we want for students. So, so how yeah. do we get students together in that intercultural space to then be able to share for, for the greater good? So, so I, I think that's where, when we talk about international education, 
that, I mean, and I'm not trying to sound like Pollyanna or overly positive because they're, but, but I do think that we need to find where the opportunities are for everyone uh, because mm. that's really, that's the power of international education. It's, it's, um, it, and I think that that's where we're going uh, to, and that's what partners want. That's what, and that's really what oh, we yeah. want. That's what they want. Yeah, yeah. And it's so actually, and 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 with the current levels of technology and and transportation and everything, it's actually very much feasible. It's very it, much feasible. It, and the experience, I, I agree with you. Like it's, yeah, I mean, with India, especially when you think of things like agriculture, India is the place to send your students to learn about it. Well, yeah. well, well, like I was in a med about it and I was like, okay, so let's, let's say that a student one, I mean, a student that comes up to me, goes to our global learning unit, wants to study abroad. Uh, hmm. Okay. And we don't have that. It's funny. We do not have agriculture at VCU, but mm -hmm. you could work on a sustainability. You could work in the engineering space there. You could yeah. work in or heritage, computer science, AI, computer yeah. science, heritage management. Like there, it is at the, the opportunities for students to work or work in teams is endless. Uh, but and, yeah. and I think, for instance, you know, about, you know, and I'll just give an example as I, you know, did a heritage walk through a metabot or whatever I thought to myself. And, 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 and you know, that's something that's going to resonate with me, obviously, thinking about history, thinking about yeah. the urban space and the, you know, the, the messaging and, and the way that I'm experiencing the space and how, religious structures or, you know, uh, the, the, uh, you know, old, you know, ways of making sure that the, the streets were clean, you know, all these things are coming to bear as you're walking through this. And then I think to myself, I back to Richmond, Virginia, where I live and where VCU is located. I mean, it has a really interesting, uh, very provocative history uh, that could be used in comparison. And so, so like, we need to be drawing all of those out so that, you know, that would be really, really important for students at a Metabot University or, a, you know, GTU to, to learn about just as it is uh, VCU students to learn, uh, you know, uh, about their corollaries. So like, I mean, it, the, the opening up and the, again, those we've talked about, like, it's almost as though this conversation today is about connection and connectors. That that really is at the heart of what we do is connecting uh, so that so that everyone learns more, too. Um, and uh, and then we instill the qualities that we all associate, you know, employers are always talking about what they want in students uh, who have had these intercultural experiences, flexibility, adaptability, working in teams, you know, the growth mindsets and, and all this sort of thing. Yeah. We need to be providing that for students across. And so we can do, and we can do it. I love it. I love it. And you're actually in, in your own way, you're trying to facilitate some of that at VCU and, and it's, it's clearly growing slowly, but steadily. Growing. Exactly. Um, and, and that's great to know. And, and I, I fully, Fully second your opinion on that. Uh, I mean, especially when I, we work with a lot of cross-cultural, you know, cross-geography um, institutions, and we always have institutions on both sides asking us on how to collaborate. But then when you bring bring them together, it usually at some point breaks down because there's a lot of admin overhead, and then you got to figure out articulation agreements and all of those things. So, yeah, I think... Uh, um, I think there's a there there for sure. Oh yeah, uh, exactly. Ex exactly. <laughs> that's that's yeah. yeah, there's another there's another literary reference. <laughs> there, there is, is there yeah. there. <laughs> there's a there there. Yeah, uh, we got our yeah. Gertrude Stein today in our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but on a uh, on a lighter note, uh, how was India? How do you uh, in your travels tell us a little bit about, you know, what what are some experiences you've had? Yeah, sure. So, so I've I've been to India a number of times. Uh, first, uh, first in uh, the first time I ever went to India was in the role as uh, you know simply as an art history professor. Um, so mm. the very first time I went, 
to, you know, to the Golden Triangle. I went to Bhopal um, to see the uh, Great Stupa at Sanchi, uh, which remains one of my favorite things that I've ever seen. I uh, mm. oftentimes say yeah, to people that if you, there, there are a number of places around the world that if I ever decide I'm going to disappear, <laughs> there, really? there, are a couple places, <laughs> there, there are a couple places I've told people they can find me. <laughs> <laughs> it beats the it, whole it, purpose of you wanting to disappear. Exactly, but 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 <laughs> but it's but it's it's such it would be such a a, a wild goose chase that they would spend yeah. uh, countless resources trying to find me. But one of those places might be Bhopal, <laughs> <laughs> right Good in the make, in the I'm shadow of. Yeah, in Sanji, yeah, yeah. The others, yeah, the others are in Brazil and Japan. So good luck and Mexico. Good luck finding me. And, um, <laughs> yeah, maybe in Sardinia too. And um, in Sardinia, but, is, yeah. So there's some, so there's some funny, funny uh, uh, places that I, I joke about. But, but what I really mean are places that have really resonated uh, with me, and um, and that's definitely one of them. On my most recent. A visit to India. I was in. I spent most of my time in Ahmedabad, which was fantastic, and in the state of Gujarat. So I, I traveled around some. Um, I also went to Hyderabad, um, mm. and I was in. De and then I, for uh, for vacation following that, I was in Delhi and Agra. So those were th that was where I was recently. But I um, on previous visits, um, I've had the privilege of visiting. I've spent quite a bit of time in Bangalore. Um, mm. I've been to Mysore, which I love, uh, was still to me. I, sometimes I think that if I'm, if I'm ever stressed out, if I close my eyes and I can see the, the beautiful landscape in Mysore, uh, all is well in the world because it's so wow, green and beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, it's uh, home to, and the, and the palace is home to the India's first elevator, which always makes me, which, which I did was, not know that <laughs> really. Yes. And then on this last trip, I saw another first but i'll have to try to remember what that was oh oh it was um when i was in um when i was in hyderabad there is a hotel there the taj hotel that has mm -hmm. the first um i think it's the first maybe the first shower bathtub or something really? something interesting <laughs> like... for, forgive me for not for not remembering but i thought to myself well how lucky am i that i've seen the first or, or no 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 it wasn't the first shower oh, bathtub forgive me it was the first telephone in Hyderabad oh they have the it first telephone. <laughs> yes but there the was one but there was the, like circle yeah yeah, yeah it was a, it was a rotary phone yes forgive yeah. me but I they they also had some uh there was something about the shower bathtub it was much nicer than anything I've ever seen but um but it was uh it was incredible but the um and I've also been to uh recently uh, to uh in the past couple of years uh to Varanasi as well mm. oh wow you've yeah. traveled more in India than I have <laughs> I am jealous <laughs> yeah. you know but, but I would say there are places that I still uh there are many places that I I've not been um but I would say that uh, having been to Varanasi, it was a really incredible experience. And I would love, we we have a partner uh, there um, with IIT BHU um, oh, and, okay. and, and, and BHU. And so yeah. it's, it's, it was, it was a, it was a great experience to be able to go there. And again, a lot of really great work that's being done, um, particularly, uh, obviously at IIT and the engineering space and our of uh, College of Engineering uh, has, you know, we've held like a virtual symposium with them, like that we've had some some interesting um, interactions. And, and that's the other thing that we've been able to do uh, through our partnerships is foster some really interesting collaborations uh, with between faculty and even sometimes between uh, administrative units. And uh, one example mm. of that for us is uh, recently we had one of our partners in Bangalore reach out uh, who were interested in uh, best practices in the United States in human resources. Uh, so their HR. And so I connected them with VCU's HR so that they could exchange ideas. And so again, that's something that might not seem big, but 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 oh, it's it is, yeah. but it's an it's a need and it it gets back at that reciprocity. Oh, you need help, we can help you with this. And 
Uh, we also have some faculty uh, who are working in collaboration uh, with uh, faculty at Ahmedabad University, both in math and also in their uh, School of Public Health, uh, which is newly created. So, so wow. there's some yeah. really it's great all, work. All going back there. to reciprocity and we can all yes. win. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We can all, I love it. I love it. This is amazing. And uh, what, if anything, so we have listeners that range from institutional faculty, admin, um, staff, students, partners, yeah. agencies, everybody. Uh, yeah. What would be, um, what would be the next big thing that you're looking, not, not just, it doesn't have to be a big thing, but what, what are you focused on? <laughs> like the next big thing, I want to solve poverty. Like, no. The next but... big thing. Because I was going to say, because I was going to say lunch. I'm just kidding. Lunch. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. I'm kidding. For meat breakfast still. Yes. No, no, it's important. But uh, uh, what is it that if people have to reach out to Jill or, or know what, mm -hmm. what Jill is after, what, what would that be? That, oh, that's, that's, a wonderful question, you know, and I would, I would, I may sound a little bit like a broken record, but I would go back to that increasing impact um, and the way that that looks. And so for us, it would mean uh, really a lot of our international partnerships taking off both in India, of course, and, and beyond, uh, but it would, and, and increasing our number of uh, students who study abroad uh, mm -hmm. and engage in global learning here on campus. Um, also, one of the okay. one of the big things I'm I'm really interested in. I work. Um, I'm very fortunate. We have um, you know wonderful administrators at, at VCU, but we've worked particularly well with our uh, vice president for research and innovation at VCU. And so, uh, in collaboration uh, with his office, we've really tried to uh, increase you know partner institutions for research and uh, the way that we can help. Uh, expand VCU's global footprint. So what I mm -hmm. would also like to see as we as we do that is um, kind of the the next big thing is is sometimes I think institutions have trouble measuring. Uh, the way that that impact and, and I mean it's it, with research it, it can be I mean it can be dollars I mean it can be number of collaborations like I I understand that that's easy, uh, but I, I'm at a a large decentralized. Uh, research intensive institution. And so to be able, what I would like to be able to do, and I know that, uh, and, and so I'm just, is to be able to more readily connect some of our faculty uh, and to understand too some of even the landscape at my own institution that we could leverage uh, to benefit the institution uh, more broadly. And so an example of that would be, uh, you know, I can ask the question, oh, who's engaged in you know, X country or whatever, uh, who, who's doing research there? And we have the answer to that. But if I could have that a little bit more at my fingertips, um, mm. I, I think that we could connect faster. Um, and it, it, so I'm, 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 I, my next big thing would be uh, I, I, ease of information uh, in terms of uh, connecting research, but even also academic collaboration. Understood. Understood. Yeah. Mainly cross institution, cross yeah, institution, cross institution. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. And and to to my earlier point too about inter institutionally, how how do we leverage? Because I what I also really see is the next big thing is again the the chain. My role as a senior international officer, I feel is, or I'm not going to say my role, but I believe the role of the senior international officer in the United States has taken on so much more, both, with, I mean, mm. for, for a number of reasons, uh, uh, you know, there's a big focus on enrollment, as you know, uh, but there's also, you know, in the way that geopolitics affect education is 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 something that we contend with on you know a, a daily basis when you go into the office each morning you 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 sort of never know i mean you you can be proactive you can be strategic but you often find yourself 
due to no fault of anybody's, uh, sometimes in a, a very defensive or responsive uh, mode, uh, because mm. that's what's demanded in international education. We oftentimes say international never sleeps, uh, because something is going to impact your students, uh, your faculty, your partnerships. Yeah. And so you have to be prepared for that. Uh, and to that end, because that's something we're all facing. That's not unique to VCU or unique to any other institution in the U.S. So as sure. we've talked uh, broadly, or I, I, I think people have been talking about sort of a national, uh, not not policy, but maybe strategy around international education. I, I think that uh, I think we all need to be open or. Uh, taking into consideration what opportunities would lie in some type of, you know, broad or, you know, more united approach, uh, regardless of what our institution type or geography is within the U.S., understanding that those needs are all different. Like my needs as a, you know, large R1 on the East Coast are, are going to be very different uh, from a small private, say, in Montana. You know, I, I understand yeah. that. But thinking very broadly over the way, you know, I, I oftentimes say international education, in my opinion, or excuse, not international education, but higher education, in my opinion, is the greatest export the United States has ever had or will have. I think it's, I'm a huge believer and I think it's a game changer uh, for our students. Um, and it's it's why the United States to me is so, so innovative and great and because it presents those opportunities for students. So again, how do we leverage that even more broadly to benefit all of our institutions and the students who want to study here? Wow, that is uh, that is so powerful, and you're right. I mean, it's it's in the top five exports for the country, and it's really important. But sometimes it gets sidelined, sidetracked, uh, and it lives in silos, like you just said sometime sometime back. Uh, the it, international it, office lives in its silos. Yeah, it it, uh, it 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 does, and I think that it's it, it, and I think a lot of times people forget about internet. Oh, excuse me, higher education once again as as an export and yes. as as something that we offer um and it doesn't mean that i'm i'm not of course i'm trying not mm. to commodify it just as i'm commodifying it <laughs> and mm. I'm, I, that's not that's not my intention i i it's it's my way of talking about its power um, oh yeah sure the power of opportunity um and so yeah. that's and that's i think the way as senior international officers it's leading international education in the u.s um i mean what other way are you going to look at it? I mean, what? What? No, I mean, have, it's yeah. it's that important. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's I I would totally second your opinion and look at it as an export because it is an export. But import export actually lifts all ships. That's just how it works. Yeah, exactly. Hundred uh, percent. <laughs> I love that. Uh, so why not? Yeah, absolutely. No, this has been great. I mean, thank you for sharing all of your thoughts and uh, and a little bit about the institution and how you operate um i think this is going to be great i'm sure uh, i'm sure we'll have some comments and and people uh, trying to reach out and and all of yes. that will start uh but thank you thank you for spending an hour uh with us thank uh, you it's actually it's been an absolute honor so thank you so much it's it's been so fun to talk about this and to and to think about it it's always nice to take a step back and and think about what we do because sometimes we're just doing what we do yeah exactly yeah we we kind of just get into the rut of it right and then we're attending the same conferences every year we're talking about the same things every year and it just keeps going on and on. It's, you know, it's a little bit of our effort and my effort to to bring the personalities from the from the back burner to the front and just talk right. about who people really are. Um, and, and that's so important. Yeah, we'll, we'll do a, a few more of these because we still haven't touched upon like your thoughts on AI and all of those cool oh, things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know so. you're like, what are your thoughts on it? Because I, I, because I also, as you can imagine, um, I'm opinionated about everything. So I have yeah. an opinion so on I everything. Would, I think that makes for a second podcast at some yeah. point. <laughs> I would love that. Yeah, I would. I would. Yeah. This was yeah, really nice. Yeah. No, that, thank you. I, I and I hope I said what you wanted. I mean, not what you want, but you know what I mean. I hope I answered questions. And yes. 
totally totally fantastic um yeah. thank you so much and uh, and thank you for joining the ai edu unlock podcast uh, with me ashish yeah. fernando and and our guest for today <laughs> okay we'll do that again <laughs> i'm sorry i didn't realize you were still yeah i was sorry. i got into okay, the outro say, so say that yeah, again I'm we'll do the, so we'll do the sorry. outro again i'm so sorry all right so <laughs> You're so funny. I love it. <laughs> uh, all right. So thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining our podcast today with me, Ashish Fernando, and our guest of the day, Jill Blondin from Virginia Commonwealth University. Thank you, Jill, for everything you've said and shared with us today. And, and we'll talk to you soon again. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and your really thoughtful questions. Thank you so much.